Artemis was meditating when the first laser stroke cut through the ceiling. He rose from the lotus position, pulled a sweater over his pajamas, and arranged some pillows on the floor. Moments later, a square of metal fell to the floor, its impact silenced by the cushions. Holly's face appeared in the hole. Artemis pointed at the pillows. You anticipated me. The LAP captain nodded. Only 13, and already predictable. I assume you used the air conditioner to vacuum the smoke. Exactly. I think we're getting to know one another too well. Holly reeled a python line from her belt, lowering it into the room. Make a loop at the bottom with the clamp and hop aboard. I'll read you in. Artemis did as he told, and in seconds he was clambering through the hole. Do we have Mr. Foley on our side? he asked. Holly handed Artemis a small cylindrical earpiece. Ask him yourself. Artemis inserted the miracle of nanotechnology. Well, Foley, astound me. Below in Haven City, the centaur rubbed his hands together. Artemis was the only one who actually understood his lectures. You're going to love this, mud boy. Not only have I wiped you from the video, not only did I erase the ceiling falling in, but I've created a simulated Artemis. Artemis was intrigued. A sim? Really? How exactly did you do that? Simple, really, said Foley modestly. I have hundreds of human movies on file. I borrowed Steve McQueen's solitary confinement scene from The Great Escape and out to his clothes. What about the face? I had some digital interrogation footage from your last visit to Haven. I put the two together and voila! Our simulated Artemis can do whatever I tell him, whenever I say. At the moment, the sim is asleep, but in half an hour, I may just instruct him to go to the bathroom. Holly reeled in her python cord. The miracles of modern science. The LEP pours millions into your department fully, and all you can do is send mud boys to the toilet. You should be nice to me, Holly. I'm doing you a big favor. If Julius knew I was helping you, he'd be extremely angry. Which is exactly why you're doing it. Holly moved quietly to the door, opened it at a crack. The corridor was clear and silent, but for the drone of panning cameras and the hum of fluorescent lighting. One section of Holly's visor displayed miniature transparent feeds from Spyro's security cameras. There were eight guards doing the rounds on the floor. Holly closed the door. Okay, let's get going. We need to reach Spiro before the guards change. Artemis arranged the carpet over the hole in the floor. Have you located his apartment? Directly above us. We need to get up there and scan his retina and thumb. An expression flashed across Artemis' face, just for a second. The scans, yes, the sooner the better. Holly had never seen that look on the human boy's features before. Was it guilt? Could it be? Is there something you're not telling me? She demanded. The expression vanished, to be replaced by the customary lack of emotion. No, Captain Short, nothing. And do we really think that now is the time for an interrogation? Holly wagged a threatening finger. Artemis, if you mess with me now, in the middle of operation, I won't forget it. Don't worry, said Artemis wryly. I will. Spira's apartment was directly above Artemis' cell. It would have made sense to reinforce the same block. Unfortunately, John Spiro did not like the idea of anyone spying on him, so there were no cameras in his section of the building. Typical, muttered Foley. Power-crazy megalomaniacs never like anyone to see their own dirty secrets. I think someone's in denial, said Holly, focusing a tight beam with from who knew Trino at the ceiling. A section of floating ceiling melted like ice in the kettle, revealing the steel above. Molted beads of metal ate into the carpet as the lasers sliced through the flooring. When the hole was of a sufficient diameter, Holly shut down the beam and popped her helmet camera into the space. Nothing appeared on the screen. Switching to infrared. A rack of suits sprang into focus. They might have been white. The wardrobe. We're in the wardrobe. Perfect, said Foley. Put him to sleep. He is asleep. It's twenty to five in the morning. Well, make sure he doesn't wake up then. Holly replaced the camera in its groove. She plucked a silver capsule from her belt and inserted it into the hole. Foley supplied the commentary for Artemis. The capsule's a sleeper deeper, in case you're wondering. Gaseous? No, brainwaves. Artemis was intrigued. Go on. Basically, it scans for brainwave patterns, then replicates them, and when the vicinity stays in the state they're in until the capsule devolves. No trace? Nope, and no after effects. Whatever they're paying me, it isn't enough. Holly counted off a minute on her visor clock. Okay, he's out, providing he wasn't awake and the sleeper deeper went in. Let's go. Spiro's bedroom was as white as his suits, except for the charred hole in the wardrobe. Holly and Artemis climbed through onto a white shag carpet. 
They stepped through the doors of the closet into a room that glowed in the dark. Futuristic furniture. White, of course. White spotlights and white drapes. Holly took a moment to study a painting that dominated one wall. Oh, give me a break, she said. The picture was in oils, completely white. There was a brass plaque on beneath it. It read, Snow Ghost. Spiro lay in the center of a huge futon, lost in the dunes of its silk sheets. Holly pulled back the covers, rolling John Spiro onto his back. Even in sleep, the man's face was malevolent, as though his dreams were every bit as despicable as his waking thoughts. Nice guy, said Holly, using her thumb to raise Spiro's left eyelid. Her helmet camera scanned the eye, storing the information on its chip. It'd be a simple matter to project the file onto the vault scanner and fool the security computer. The thumb scan would not be so simple. Because the device was a gel scanner, the tiny sensors would be searching for the actual ridges and whorls of Spiro's thumb. A projection would not do. It had to be 3D. Artemis had come up with the idea of using a latex memory bandage, standard issue in any, any LEP first aid kit, the same latex used to glue the microphone to his throat. All they had to do was wrap Spiro's thumb in a bandage for a moment, and they would have the mold of the digit. Holly spooled a bandage from her belt, tearing off a six-inch strip. It won't work, said Artemis. Holly's heart sank. This was it, the thing that Artemis hadn't told her. What won't work? The memory latex. It won't fool the gel scanner. Holly climbed off the futon. I don't have time for this, Artemis. We don't have time for it. The memory latex will make a perfect copy right down to the last molecule. Artemis' eyes were downcast. A perfect model is true, but in reverse. Like a photo negative. Ridges where there should be grooves. Dervit! swore Holly. The mud boy was right. Of course he was. Scanner would read the latex as a completely different thumbprint. Her cheeks glowed red behind the visor. You knew this, mud boy. You knew this all along. Artemis didn't bother denying it. I'm amazed no one else spotted it. So why lie? Artemis walked around to the far side of the bed, grasping Spiro's right hand. Because there is no way to fool the jail scanner. It has to see the real thumb. Holly snorted. What do you want me to do? Cut it off and take it with us? Artemis' silence was response enough. What, you want me to cut off his thumb? Are you insane? Artemis waited patiently for the outburst to pass. Listen to me, Captain. It's only a temporary measure. The thumb can be a reattached, true? Holly raised her palms. Just shut up, Artemis. Just close your mouth, and I thought you changed. The commander was right. There is no change in human nature. Four minutes, persisted Artemis. We have four minutes to crack the vault and get back. Spira won't feel a thing. Holly felt as though her helmet was shrinking. Artemis, I'll stun you, so help me. Think, Holly, I had no choice but to lie about my plan. Would you have agreed if I had told you earlier? No, and I'm not agreeing now! Artemis' face glowed as pale as the walls. You have to, Captain, there is no other way. Holly waved Artemis away as though he were a persistent fly and spoke into her helmet mic. Foley, are you listening to this insanity? It sounds insane, Holly, but if you don't get this technology back, we could lose a whole lot more than a thumb. I can't believe it. Whose side are you on, Foley? I don't even want to think about the legal ramifications of this. The centaur snickered. <laughs> legal ramifications? We're a tad beyond the court systems here, Captain. This is a secret operation. No records and no clearance. If this came out, we'd all be out of a job. A thumb here or there is not going to make any difference. Holly turned on the climate control in her helmet, directing a blast of cold air at her forehead. Are you sure we can make it, Artemis? Artemis ran a few mental calculations. Yes, I'm sure. And anyway, we have no option but to try. Holly crossed to the other side of the futon. I can't believe I'm even considering this. She lifted Spiro's hand gently. He did not react, not so much as a sleep murmur. Behind his eyelids, Spiro's eyes jittered in REM sleep. Holly drew her weapon. Of course, in theory it was perfectly feasible to remove a digit, then magically reattach it. There would be no harm done, and quite possibly the injection of magic would clear up a few of the liver spots on Spiro's hand. But that wasn't the point. This was not how magic was supposed to be used. Artemis was manipulating the people to his own ends once again. Six-inch beam, said Foley in her ear. Very high frequency. We need a clean cut, and give him a shot of magic while you're doing it. It might buy you a couple minutes. For some reason, Artemis was checking behind Spiro's ears. Hmm, he said. Clever. What now? hissed Holly. 
Artemis stepped back. Nothing important. Continue. Four minutes was the textbook healing deadline. After that, there was no guarantee that the thumb would take. The skin would bind, but the muscles and nerve endings could reject. A red glow reflected from her visor as a short burst of concentrated laser beam erupted from the nozzle of her neutrino. One cut, said Artemis. Clean. Holly glared at him. Don't, my boy. Not a word. Especially not advice. Artemis backed off. Certain battles were won by retreating. Using her left thumb and forefinger, Holly made a circle around Spiro's thumb. She sent a gentle pulse of magic into the human's hand. In seconds, the skin tightened, lines disappeared, and muscle tone returned. Filter, she sent her microphone. X-ray. The filter dropped, and suddenly everything was transparent, including Spiro's hand. The bones and joints were clearly visible below the skin. They only needed the print, so she would cut between the knuckles. It would be difficult enough reattaching under pressure without adding a complex joint into the equation. Holly took a breath and held it. The sleeper deeper would act more efficiently than any anesthetic. Spiro would not flinch or feel the smallest jolt of discomfort. She made the cut. A smooth cut that sealed as it went. Not a drop of blood was spilled. Artemis wrapped the thumb in a handkerchief from Spiro's closet. Nice work, he said. Let's go. The clock is ticking. Artemis and Holly climbed through the wardrobe to the 85th floor. There was almost a mile and a half of corridor on this floor, and six guards patrolling it in pairs at any time. The routes were specifically planned so that one pair would always have an eyeball sighting of the vault door. The vault corridor was 100 yards long and took 80 seconds to travel. At the end of that 80 seconds, the next pair of guards stepped around the corner. Luckily, two of the guards were seeing things in a different light this particular morning. Foley gave them their cue. Okay, our boys are approaching their corner. Are you sure it's them? These gorillas all look the same. Small head, no necks. I'm sure. Their targets are showing up bright and clear. Holly had painted pecs and chips with a stamp generally used by Customs and Immigration for invisible visas. The stamps glowed orange when viewed through an infrared filter. Holly pushed Artemis out the door in front of her. Okay, go. And no sarcastic comments. There was no need for the warning. Even Artemis Fowl was not inclined to be sarcastic at such a dangerous stage of the plan. He ran down the corridor straight toward the two mammoth security guards. The jackets protruded angularly beneath their armpits. Guns, no doubt. Big ones with lots of bullets. Are you sure they're mesmerized? He asked Holly, who was hovering overhead. Of course! Their minds are so blank it was like writing it with chalk on a board. But I could stun them if you'd prefer. No, panted Artemis. No trace. There must be no trace. Pex and Chips were closer now, compared the merits of various fictional characters. Captain Hook rocks, said Pex. He would kick Barney's purple butt ten times out of ten. Chip sighed. You're missing the whole point of Barney. It's a values thing, but kicking is not the issue. They walked right past Artemis without seeing him. And why would they? Holly had mesmerized them not to notice anybody out of the ordinary on this floor, unless they were specifically pointed out to them. The outer security booth lay before them. There were approximately 40 seconds left before the next set of guards turned the corner. The unmesmerized set. Just over half a minute, Holly. You know what to do. Holly turned up the thermocoils in her suit so they were exactly at room temperature. This would fuel the lattice of lasers that crisscrossed the vault's entrance. Next, she set her wings to a gentle hover. Any more downtrod could activate the pressure pad underfoot. She pulled herself forward, finding purchase along the wall where her helmet told her no sensors were hidden. The pressure pad trembled from the air displacement, but not enough to activate the sensor. Holly watched her progress impatiently. Hurry, Holly, 20 seconds. Holly grunted something unprintable, dragging herself to within touching distance of the door. Video file Spiro 3, she said, and her helmet computer ran the footage of John Spiro punching in the vault door code. She mimicked his actions, and inside the steel door, six reinforced pistons retracted, allowing the counterweighted door to swing wide on its hinges. All external alarms were automatically shut off. The secondary door stood firm, three red lights burning on its panel. Only three barriers left now. The gel pad, the retina scan, and the voice activation. This kind of operation was too complicated for voice command. Foley's computers had been known to misinterpret orders, even though the centaur insisted it was fairy error. Holly ripped back the Velcro strap covering the helmet command pad on her wrist. 
First, she projected a 3D image of Spiro's eyeball to a height of 5 foot 6. The retina scanner sent out a revolving beam to read the virtual eyeball. Apparently satisfied, it disabled the first lock. A red light switched to green. The next step was to call up the appropriate sound wave file to trick the voice check. The equipment was very sophisticated and could not be fooled by a recording. A human recording, that is. Foley's digital microphones made copies that were indistinguishable from the real thing. Even stinkworms, whose entire bodies were covered with ears, could be attracted by a worm mating hiss from Foley's recording equipment. He was currently in negotiation with a fairy insect collection agency for the rights. Holly played the file through her helmet speakers. John Spira, I am the boss, so open up quick. Alarm number two disengaged, another light green. Excuse me, Captain, said Artemis, an undercurrent of apprehension creeping into his voice. We're almost out of time. He unwrapped the thumb and stepped past Holly onto the red floor plate. Artemis pressed the thumb into the scanner. Green gel oozed into the severed digit's whorls. The alarm display flashed green. It had worked. Of course it had. The thumb was genuine, after all. But nothing else happened. The door didn't open. Holly punched Artemis in the shoulder. Well, are we in? Apparently not. The punching is not helping my concentration, by the way. Artemis glared at the console. What had he missed? Think, boy, think. Put those famed brain cells to work. He leaned closer to the secondary door, shifting his weight from his back leg. Beneath him, the red plate squeaked. Of course, exclaimed Artemis. He grabbed Holly, hugging her close. It's not just a red marker, he explained hurriedly. It's weight sensitive. Artemis was right. Their combined mass was close enough to Spiro's own to hoodwink the scales. Obviously a mechanical device. A computer would never have been fooled. The secondary door slid in its groove below their feet. Artemis handed Holly the thumb. Go, he said. Spiro's time is running out. I'm right behind you. Holly took the thumb. And if you're not, then we go to plan B. Holly nodded slowly. Let's hope we don't have to. Let's hope. Artemis strode into the vault. He ignored the fortune in jewels and bearer bonds, heading straight for the cube's plexiglass prison. There were two bullish security guards blocking the way. Both men had oxygen masks strapped over their faces and were unnaturally still. Excuse me, gentlemen. Would either of you mind if I borrowed Mr. Spiro's cube? Neither man responded, not so much as a flicker of an eyebrow. This was undoubtedly because of the paralytic gas in their oxygen tanks, concocted from the venom of a nest of Peruvian spiders. The gas was similar in chemical makeup to a salve used by South American natives as anesthetic. Artemis keyed in the code, which Foley was reciting in his ear, and the plexiglass case slid open. The four sides of the plexiglass box descended into the column on silent motors, leaving the C-cube unprotected. He reached out a hand for the box. Holly climbed through the wardrobe into Spiro's bedroom. The industrialist lay in the same position in which she had left him, his breath regular and normal. The stopwatch on Holly's visor read 357 and counting. Just in time. Holly unwrapped the thumb gingerly, aligning it with the rest of the digit. Spiro's hand felt cold and unhealthy to her touch. She used the magnification filter on her visor to zoom in on the severed thumb. As close as she could figure, the two halves were lined up. Heal, she said, and the magical sparks erupted from the tips of her fingers, sinking into the two halves of Spiro's thumb. Threads of blue light stitched the demers and the epidermis together, fresh skin breaking through the old to conceal the cut. The thumb began to vibrate and bubble. Steam vented from the pores, forming a mist around Spiro's hand. His arm shook violently, the shock traveling across his bony chest. Spiro's back arched until Holly thought it would snap. Then the industrialist collapsed onto the bed. Throughout the entire process, his heart never skipped a beat. A few stray sparks skipped along Spiro's body like stones on a pond, targeting the area behind both ears, exactly where Artemis had been looking earlier. Curious, Holly pulled back one ear to reveal a crescent-shaped scar, rapidly being erased by the magic. There was a matching scar on behind the other ear. Holly used her visor to zoom in on one of the scars. Foley, what do you make of these? Surgery, replied the centaur. Maybe our friend Spiro got himself a facelift. Or maybe... Or maybe it's not Spiro, completed Holly, switching to Artemis' channel. Artemis, it's not Spiro. It's a double. Do you hear me? Respond, Artemis. Artemis didn't reply. 
Maybe because he wouldn't, maybe because he couldn't. Armas reached out a hand for the box, and a false wall hissed back pneumatically. Behind it stood John Spiro and Arno Blunt. Spiro's smile was so wide he could have swallowed a slice of watermelon. He clapped his hands, jewelry jangling. Bravo, Master Fowl. Some of us didn't think you'd get this far. Blunt took a hundred dollar bill from his wallet and handed it to Spiro. Thank you very much, Arno. I hope this teaches you not to bet against the house. Artemis nodded thoughtfully. In the bedroom, that was a double. Yeah, my costume, my cousin. We got the same shape, Ted. One or two cuts, we could be peas in a pod. So you set the gel scanner to accept his print. For one night only. I wanted to see how far you'd get. You're an amazing kid, Artie. No one has ever made it into the vault before, and you'd be amazed at how many professionals I've tried. There are obviously a few glitches in my system, something that security people have to look at. How'd you get in here anyway? You don't appear to have Costa with you. Trade secret. Spiro stepped down from the low platform. Eh, no matter. We'll review the tapes. There are bound to be a couple of cameras you couldn't rig. One thing is for sure, you didn't do it without help. Check it for a mirror piece, Arno. It took Blunt less than five seconds to find the earpiece. He plucked it out triumphantly, crushing the tiny cylinder beneath his boot. Spiro sighed. I have no doubt, Arno, that that little electronic wonder was worth more than you will make in a lifetime. I don't really know why I keep you around. I really don't. Blunt grimaced. His teeth were plexiglass and half filled with blue oil. A macabre wave machine. Sorry, Mr. Spiro. He'll be sorry. You'll be sorry you're still my dentally challenged friend, said Artemis, because Butler is coming. Blunt took an involuntary step backward. Don't think I don't think that mumbo jumbo scaring me. Butler is dead. I saw him go down. Go down, perhaps. But did you see him die? If I remember the sequence of events correctly, after you shot Butler, he shot you. Blunt touched the sutures on his temple. A lucky shot. Lucky? Butler is a proud marksman. I wouldn't say that to his face. Spiro laughed delightedly. <laughs> the kid is messing with your mind, Arno. Thirteen years old and he's playing you like a grand piano in Carnegie Hall. Get yourself a spine, man. You're supposed to be a professional. Blunt tried to pull himself together, but the ghost of Butler haunted his features. Spiro plucked the sea cube from its cushion. This is fun, Artie. All this tough talk and repartee, but it doesn't mean anything. I win again. You've been outflanked. This has all been a game to me. Amusement. Your little operation has been most educational, if pathetic. But you gotta realize that it's over now. You're on your own, and I don't have time for any more games. Artemis sighed, the picture of defeat. All of this has been a lesson, hasn't it? Just show me who's boss. Exactly. It takes some people a while to learn. I find that the smarter the enemy, the bigger the ego. You had to realize that you were no match for me, because you, before you even had to do what I've asked. Spiro placed a bony hand on the Irish boy's shoulder. Artemis could feel the weight of his jewelry. Now listen carefully, kid. I want you to unlock this cube. No more blarney. I never met a computer nerd yet who didn't leave himself a back door. You open this baby up now, or I'm going to stop being amused. And believe me, you don't want that. Artemis took the blue cube in both hands, staring at its flat screen. This was the delicate phase of his plan. Spiro had to believe that once again he had outmaneuvered Artemis Fowl. Do it, Artie. Do it now. Artemis ran a hand across his dry lips. Very well, I need a minute. Spiro patted his shoulder. I'm a generous man. Take two. He nodded at Blunt. Stay close, Arno. I don't want our little friend setting up any more booby traps. Artemis sat at a stainless steel table, exposing the cube's inner workings. He quickly manipulated a complicated bunch of fiber optics, removing one strand altogether, the LEP blocker. After less than a minute, he resealed the cube. Spiro's eyes were wide with anticipation, and dreams of unlimited wealth danced in his brain. Good news, Artie. I only want good news only. Artemis was more subdued now, as if the reality of his situation had finally eaten through his cockiness. I've rebooted it. It's working, except... Spiro waved his hands. Bracelets tinkled like cat's bells. 
Except? This better be an itty bitty except kind of thing. It's nothing, hardly worth mentioning. I had to revert to version 1.0. Version 1.2 was coded strictly to my voice patterns. 1.0 is less secure, if a bit more temperamental. Temperamental? You're a box, not my grandmother, Cube. I am not a box, said Foley, the Cube's new voice, thanks to the removed blocker. I'm a marvel of artificial intelligence. I live, therefore I learn. See what I mean? said Artemis weakly. The centaur was going to blow it. Spiro's suspicions must not be aroused at this stage. Spiro glared at the cube as though it were an underling. Are you giving me attitude, mister? The cube did not reply. You have to address it by its name, explained Artemis. Otherwise, it would answer every question within hearing distance of its sensors. And what's its name? Juliet often used the expression, duh. Artemis never used such colloquiums himself, but it would have been apt at this particular moment. Its name is Cube. Okay, Cube, are you going to give me attitude? I will give you whatever it is my processing capacity to give. Spiro rubbed his palms with childish glee, jewelry flashing like ripples in a sunset sea. Okay, let's try this baby out. Cube, can you tell me, are there any satellites monitoring the building? Foley was silent for a moment. Artemis could imagine him calling up his sat track information on a screen. Just one at the moment, though, judging by from the ion trails, this building has been hit more th with more rays than the Millennium Falcon. Spiro shot Artemis a glance. His personality chip is faulty, explained the boy. That's why I discontinued him. It. We can fix that at any time. Spiro nodded. He didn't want his very own technologi technological genie growing the personality of a gorilla. What about that group, the LEP cube? He asked. They were monitoring me in London. Are they watching? The LEP? That's a Lebanese satellite TV network, said Foley, following Artemis' instructions. Game shows mostly. Their footprint doesn't reach this far. Okay, forget about them, Cube. I need to know that satellite serial number. Foley consulted his screen. Uh, let me see. U.S. registered to the federal government, number ST1147W. Spiro clenched both fists. Yes, correct. I happen to know I already have that information myself. Cube, you have passed my test. The billionaire danced about the laboratory, reduced to childish displays by his greed. I'm telling you, Artie, this has taken years off me. I feel like putting on a tuxedo and going to prom. Indeed. I don't know where to start. Should I make my own money, or should I rip somebody else's? Artemis forced a smile. The world is your oyster. Spiro patted the cube gently. Exactly. That's exactly what it is, and I'm going to take every pearl it has to offer. Pecks and Chips arrived at the vault door, guns drawn. Mr. Spiro, stammered Pecks, is this some kind of drill? Spiro laughed. <laughs> oh, look, here comes the cavalry, an eternity too late. No, this is not a drill, and I would dearly love to know how little Artemis here got past you two. The hired muscle stared at Artemis as though he had just appeared from nowhere, which for their mesmerized brains, he had. Well, I don't know, Mr. Spiro, we never saw him. You want I should take him outside for a little accident? Spiro laughed, a short, nasty bark. Ha! I got a new word for you two dumbbells. Expendable. You are and he isn't. Just yet. Get it? So just stand there and look dangerous. Otherwise, I may have to replace you with two shaved gorillas. Spiro gazed into the cube screen, as though there was nobody else in the room. I reckon I got 20 years left in me. After that, the world can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. I have no family, no heirs. There's no need to build for the future. I'm going to suck this planet dry, and with this cube I can do whatever I want to whoever I want. I know the first thing I'd do, said Pex. His eyes seemed surprised that the words were coming out of his mouth. Spiro froze. He wasn't used to being interrupted in mid-rant. What'd you want to do, dumbbell? Buy yourself a booth at Merv's Ribbon Roast? Nah said Pex. I stick it to those phone text guys. They've been rubbing Spiro Industries' nose in it for years. It was an electric idea. Not only because Pex had actually had an idea, but because it was actually a good one. The notion lit a thoughtful spark in Spiro's eyes. Phone text, I hate those guys. Nothing would give me greater satisfaction than to destroy that bunch of second-rate phone freaks. But how? Now it was Chips' turn. I hear they're working on a new top-secret communicator. Super life battery or something. Spiro did a double take. First pecs, now chips. 
Next thing you know, they'd be learning to read. Nevertheless. Cube, said Spiro, I want you to access the phone ticks database. Copy the schematics for all their projects in development. No can do, boss man. Phone text is operating on a closed system. No internet connection whatsoever in their R&D department. I have to be on site. Spiro's, Spiro's euphoria disappeared. He rounded on Artemis. What's he talking about? Artemis coughed, clearing his throat. <clears throat> the cube cannot scan a closed system unless the Omnid sensor is actually touching the computer, or at least close by. Phone text is so paranoid about hackers that the research and development lab is completely contained, buried under several floors of solid rock. They don't even have email. I know, because I've tried to hack it myself a few times. But the cube scanned the satellite, didn't it? The satellite was broadcasting, and if it's broadcasting, the cube can trace it. Spiro toyed with the links of his ID chain. So I'd have to go to phone ticks. I wouldn't recommend it, said Artemis. It's a lot to risk for the sake of a personal vendetta. Blunt stepped forward. Let me go, Mr. Spiro. I'll get those plans. Spiro chewed on a handful of vitamin supplements from a dispenser on his belt. It's a nice idea, Arno. Good work. But I'm reluctant to hand over control of the cube over to anyone else. Who knows what temptation they might yield to. Cube, can you disable the phone text alarm system? <clears throat> can a dwarf blow a hole in his pants? What? Uh, nothing. Technical term. You wouldn't understand. I've already disabled the phone text system. What about the guards, Cube? Can you disable them? No problemo. I could remote activate the internal security measure. Which is... Tanks of vapor inside the air vents. Sleeping gas. Illegal, by the way, according to Chicago state law. But clever. No after effects. Untraceable. The intruder comes to lock up two hours later. K Spiro cackled. Those phone paranoid phone text boys. Go ahead, Cube. Knock them out. Nighty night, said Foley, with a glee that seemed all too real. Good. Now, Cube, all that stands between us and the phone text blueprints is an encrypted computer. Don't make me laugh. They haven't invented a unit of time short enough to measure how long it'll take me to crack the phone text hard disk. Spiro clipped the cube onto his belt. You know something? I'm starting to like this guy. Artemis made one last sincere-sounding attempt to contain his situation. Mr. Spiro, I really don't think that's a good idea. Of course you don't, laughed John Spiro, jangling toward the door. That's why I'm bringing you along. Spiro selected the Lincoln Town Car from his extensive garage. It was a 90s model with fake registration. He often used it as a getaway vehicle. It was old enough to be unremarkable. And even if police did get a shot of the plates, it wouldn't lead them anywhere. Blunt parked outside of Fontex's R&D lab's main entrance. A security guard was visible at his desk, behind the glass revolving door. Arno pulled a pair of folded binoculars from the glove compartment. He focused on the guard. Sleeping like a baby, he announced. Spiro clapped him on the shoulder. Good, we have less than two hours. Can we do it? If this cube is as good as he says he is, then we can be in and out in 15 minutes. It's a machine, said Artemis coldly. Not one of your steroid munching associates. Blunt glanced over his shoulder. Artemis sat in the back seat, squashed between pecks and chips. You're very brave all of a sudden. Artemis shrugged. What have I got to lose? After all, things hardly can get worse. There was a regular door beside the revolving one. The cube remote activated the buzzer, admitting the band of intruders to the lobby. No alarms sounded, and no platoon of security guards came rushing to detain them. Spiro strode down the corridor, emboldened by his newfound technological friend, and the thought of finally putting phone ticks out of business. The security elevator put up no more resistance to the cube than a picket fence would to a tank. And soon, Sparrow and company were riding the eight floors down to the sunken laboratory. We're going underground, chortled Pex. Down here is where the dinosaur bones are. Did you know that after a billion, million years, dinosaur dung turns to diamonds? Usually a comment like that would have been a good shooting offense. But Sparrow was in a good mood. No, I didn't know that, Pex. Maybe I should pay your wages in dung. Pex decided it would be better for his finances if he just kept his mouth shut from then on. The lab itself was protected by a thumbprint scanner. Not even gel. It was a simple matter for the cube to scan the fingerprint on the plate, then project it back onto the sensor. There wasn't even a key code backup. Easy, crowed Spiro. I should have done this years ago. A little credit would be nice, said Foley, unable to hide his peak. After all, I did get us in here and disable the guards. Spiro held the box before him. 
Not crushing you into scrap metal cube is my way of saying thank you. You're welcome, grumbled Foley. Arno Blunt checked the security monitor bank. Throughout the facility, guards lay unconscious, one with half a ham sandwich stuffed in his mouth. I gotta admit it, Spyro. This is beautiful. Fontex is even gonna have to foot the bill for the sleeping gas. Spiro glanced toward the ceiling. Several camera lights winked red in the shadows. Cube, are we gonna have to raid the video room on our way out? It ain't gonna happen, said Foley, the method actor. I wiped your patterns from the video. Artemis was suspended by the armpits between pecs and chips. Traitor, he murmured. I gave you life, Cube. I am your creator. Yeah, well, maybe you made me too much like you, Fowl. Arum est potestist. Gold is power. I'm just doing what you taught me. Spiro patted the cube fondly. I love this guy. He's like a brother I never had. I thought you had a brother, said Chips, puzzled, which was not unusual for him. Okay, he's like a brother I actually like. The phone tech server was located in the center of the lab, a monolithic hard drive with Python-like cables rippling out to various workstations. Spiro unclipped his new best friend from his belt. Where do you need to be to be, Cube? Just pop me down on the lid of the server, and my omnisensor will do the rest. Spiro complied, and in seconds, schematics were flickering across the C-Cube's tiny screen. I have them, crowed Spiro, his hands two fists of triumph. That's the last snide email and stock prices I get from these guys. Download complete, said Foley smugly. We have every Fontex project for the next decade. Spiro cradled the cube against his chest. Beautiful. I can launch our own version of the Phonetex phone before they do, making myself an extra few extra million before I release the cube. Arno's attention was focused on the security monitors. Uh, Mr. Spiro, I think we have a situation here. A situation? growled Spiro. What does that mean? You're not a soldier anymore, Blunt. Speak English. The New Zealander tapped a screen as if that would change what he was saying. I mean, we have a problem. A big problem. Spiro grabbed Artemis by the shoulders. What have you done, Fowl? Is this some kind of... The accusation died before it could be completed. Spiro had noticed something. Your eyes! What's wrong with your eyes? They don't match. Artemis treated him with his best vampire smile. All the better to see you with, Spiro. In the phone ticks lobby, the sleeping security guard suddenly regained her senses. It was Juliet. She peeped out from under the brim of a borrowed cap to make sure Spiro had not left anyone in the corridor. Following Artemis's capture in Spiro's vault, Holly had flown them both to Fontix to initiate Plan B. Of course, there had been no sleeping gas. For that matter, there had only been two guards. One was taking a restroom break, and the other was doing rounds on the upper floors. Still, Spiro did not need to know that. He was busy watching Foley's family of sim security snoring all over the building, thanks to a video clip of the Fontix system. Juliet lifted the desk phone and dialed three numbers. Nine, one, one. Spiro reached two fingers delicately into Artemis's eye, plucking out the iris cam. He studied it closely, noting the microcircuitry on the concave side. This is electronic, he whispered. Amazing. What is it? Artemis blinked a tear from his eye. It's nothing. It was never here, just as I was never here. Spiro's face twisted in sheer hatred. You are here, all right, Fowl, and you'll never leave here. Blunt tapped his employer on the shoulder, an act of unforgivable familiarity. Boss, Mr. Spiro, you really need to say this. Juliet stripped off her phone tech security jacket. Underneath, she wore a Chicago PD SWAT uniform. Things could get hair in the R&D lab, and it was her job to make sure that Artemis did not get hurt. She hid behind a pillar in the lobby and waited for the sirens. Spiro stared at the lab security monitors. The pictures had changed. There were no more sleeping guards around the facility. Instead, the screens played a tape of Spiro and his cronies breaking into phone techs, with one crucial difference. There was no trace of Artemis on the screen. What's happening, Cube? spluttered Spiro. You said we've all been wiped from the tapes. I lied. It must be the criminal personality I'm developing. Spiro smashed the cube against the floor. It remained intact. Toph Polymer said Artemis, picking up the microcomputer. Almost unbreakable. Unlike you, retorted Spiro. Artemis looked like a doll between pecs and chips. Don't you understand yet? You're all on tape. The cube was working for me. Big deal, so we're on tape. 
All we have to do is pay the security booth a visit and take the recordings. It's not going to be that simple. Spiro still believed that there was a way out. And why not? Who's going to stop me? Little old you? Artemis pointed to the screens. No, little old them. The Chicago PD brought everything they had and a few things they had to borrow. Fontix was the city's biggest single employer, not to mention one of the top five subscribers to the Police Benevolent Fund. When the 911 call came from their offices, the duty sergeant put out a citywide call. In less than five minutes, there were 20 uniforms and a full SWAT team beating on the Fontix doors. Two choppers hovered overhead, and eight snipers lined the roofs of adjacent buildings. No one was leaving the area, unless they were invisible. The Fontex security guard had just returned from his rounds and noticed the intruders on the monitors. Shortly after, then, he noticed a group of Chicago PD tapping the door with their gun barrels. He buzzed them in. I was just about to call you guys. There's a bunch of intruders in the vault. They must have tunneled into something because they don't come past me. The security guard on a restroom break was even more surprised. He was just finishing off the sports section of the Herald Tribune when two very serious looking men in body armor burst into the cubicle. ID, growled one, who apparently did not have the time for full sentences. The security guard held up his laminated card with a shaking hand. Stay put, sir, advised the other police officer. He didn't have to say it twice. Juliet slipped out from behind the pillar, joining the ranks of the SWAT team. She pointed her gun and roared with the best of them, and was instantly assimilated into the group. Their assault was cut short by a tiny problem. There was only one access point to the lab, the elevator shaft. Two officers pried open the elevator door with crowbars. Here's our dilemma, said one. We cut the power, but we can't get the elevator up here. If we call the elevator up here first, then we tip off for intruders. Juliet shouldered herself to the front of the group. Excuse me, sir. Let me go down the cables. I blow the doors and you cut the power. The commander didn't even consider it. No, too dangerous. The intruders will have plenty of time to put a hundred rounds into the elevator. Who are you, anyway? Juliet took a small gripper from her belt. She clipped it onto the elevator cable and hopped into the shaft. I'm new, she said, disappearing into the blackness. In the laboratory, Spiro and company were hypnotized by the monitors. Foley had allowed the screens to show what was actually happening on the upper levels. Swa, said Blunt. Helicopters, heavy armament. How did this happen? Spiro smacked his own forehead repeatedly. A setup, this entire thing, a setup. I suppose Mo Diggins was working for you too. Yes, pecs and chips too, even though they didn't know it. You would never have come here if I had suggested it. But how? How'd you do this? It's not even possible. Artemis glanced at the monitors. Obviously it is. I knew you'd be wanting me for the Spiro Needle Vault. After that, all I had to do was use your own hatred of phone ticks to lure you here, out of your environment. If I go down, so do you. Incorrect. I was never here, and the tapes will prove it. But you are here, roared Spiro, his nerves shot. His whole body vibrated, and spittle sprayed from his lips in a wide arc. Your dead body will prove it. Give me the gun, Arno. I'm going to shoot him. Blunt could not hide his disappointment, but he did as he was told. Spiro pointed the weapon with shaky hands. Pex and Chips stepped rapidly to one side. The boss was not known for his marksmanship. You've taken everything from me, he shouted. Everything! Artemis was strangely calm. You don't understand, John. It's like I told you. I was never here. He paused for breath. And one more thing. About my name, Artemis. You were right in London. It is generally a female name. After the Greek goddess of archery. But every now and then, a male comes along with such a talent for hunting that he earns the right to use the name. I am that male. Artemis the Hunter. I hunted you. And just like that, he disappeared. Holly had been hovering above Spiro and company all the way through from the Spiro Needer to the Fontex building. She had gotten permission to enter the facility minutes earlier, when Julia had called to inquire about public tours. Julia had put on her best cutesy voice for the tour guide. Hey, mister, is it okay if I bring my invisible friend? Sure it is, honey, replied the guide. Bring your security blanket, too, if it makes you happy. They were in. Holly hovered at ceiling level, following Artemis' progress below. The bun boy's plan was fraught with risk. If Spiro decided to shoot him in the needle, then it was all over. But no, just as Artemis had predicted, Spiro had opted to glow for as long as possible, basking in the glow of his own demented genius. 
But of course, it wasn't his own genius. It was Artemis. Artemis had orchestrated this whole operation from beginning to end. It had even been his idea to mesmerize pecs and chips. It was crucial that they plant the idea to invade phone ticks. Holly was ready when the elevator door opened. She had her weapon charged and target selected. But she couldn't go. Wait for the signal. Artemis dragged it out. Melodramatic to the end. And then, just, as, just when Holly was about to disregard her orders and start blasting, he spoke. I am that male. Artemis the Hunter. I hunted you. Artemis the Hunter. The Signal. Holly squeezed the manual throttle on her wing rig, descending to an altitude of three feet. She clipped Artemis onto a retractable cord on her moon belt, then dropped a sheet of camfoil in front of him. To everybody in the room, it would seem as though the boy had disappeared. Up we go, she said, though Artemis could not hear her, and opened the throttle wide. In less than a second, they were nestled safely among the cables and ducts that ran along the ceiling. Below them, John Spiro lost his mind. Spiro blinked. The boy had gone. Just gone. It couldn't be. He was John Spiro. Nobody outsmarted John Spiro. He turned to Pex and Chips, gesticulating wildly with the gun. Where is he? Huh? said the bodyguards in perfect unison, unrehearsed. Where is Artemis Fowl? What'd you do with him? Nothing, Mr. Spiro. We were just standing here playing the shoulder game. Fowl said you were working for him, so hand him over. Pex's brain was churning. This was an operation akin to a blender mixing concrete. Careful, Mr. Spiro. Guns are dangerous, especially the end with the hole. This isn't over, Artemis Fowl, Spiro roared at the ceiling. I will find you. I will never give up. You've got John Spiro's word on it. He began to fire random shots, blowing holes in monitors, vents, and conduits. One even came within three feet of Artemis. Pex and Chips were not quite sure what was going on, but decided it would be a good idea to join them in the fun. They pulled out their weapons and began shooting up the lab. Blunt did not get involved. He considered his contract of, un of employment terminated. There was no way out of this for Spiro. It was every man for himself. He crossed the to the wall's metal paneling and began dismantling it with the power screwdriver. A section dropped from its casing. Behind it, it a two-inch cable space, then solid concrete. They were trapped. Behind him, the elevator door dinged. Juliet was crouched in the lift shaft. We're clear, said Holly in her earpiece, but Spiro is shooting up the lab. Juliet frowned. Her principal was in danger. Knock him out with a neutrino. I can't. If Spiro was unconscious when the police arrived, he could claim a frame up. Okay, I'm going in. Negative. Wait for SWAT. No, you take out the weapons. I'll handle the rest. Mulch had given Juliet a bottle of dwarf rock polish. She poured a little puddle on the elevator roof and dissolved like a fat on a pan. Juliet hopped into the carriage, crouching low in case Blunt decided to put a few rounds into the elevator. On three. Juliet, I'm going on three. Okay. Juliet reached up to the door open button. One. Holly drew her neutrino, locking all four targets into her visor's targeting system. Two. Holly unshielded for accuracy. The vibration would throw her aim right off. For a few seconds, she would have to hide behind the foil with Artemis. Three! Juliet pressed the button. Holly squeezed off four shots. Artemis had less than a minute to make his move. Less than a minute while Holly targeted and disarmed Spiro and company. The circumstances were hardly ideal. Screaming, gunfire, and general mayhem. But then again, what better time to implement a final step in this stage of the plan? A very vital step. The second Holly unshielded to fire, Artemis scrolled out a plexiglass keyboard from the C-Cube's base and began to type. In seconds, he had hacked into Spiro's bank accounts, all 37 of them in institutions from the Isle of Man to the Caymans. The various account numbers locked into place. He had access to each secret fund. The cube quickly trotted up the total funds. 2.8 billion US dollars, not counting the contents of various safety deposit boxes which could not be touched over the net. 2.8 billion. Plenty to restore the foul status as one of the top five richest Irish families. Just as he was about to complete the transaction, Artemis remembered his father's words again. His father, returned to him by the fairy folk. And what about you, Artie? Will you make the journey with me? When the moment comes, will you take your chance to be a hero? Did he really need billions of dollars? 
Of course he needed it. Aurum est to potestas, gold is power. Really? Will you take your chance to be a hero? To make a difference? Because he could not groan aloud, Artemis rolled his eyes and gritted his teeth. Well, if he was going to be a hero, he would be a well-paid one. He quickly deducted a 10% finder's fee from the 2.8 billion, then sent the rest to Amnesty International. He made the transaction irreversible, in case he weakened later on. Artemis wasn't finished yet. There was one more good deed he had to be attended to. The success of this venture depended on Foley's being too busy watching the show to notice Artemis hacking into his system. He brought up the LEP site and set the code breaker working on a password. It took 10 valuable seconds per minute, but he was soon flying through LEP microsites. Artemis found what he needed on per profiles. Mulch and Diggum's complete arrest record. From there, it was a simple matter to follow the electron trail back to the original search warrant for Mulch's dwelling. Artemis changed the date on the warrant to read the day after Mulch's arrest. This meant that all subsequent arrests and convictions were null and void. A good lawyer would have him out of prison in a heartbeat. I'm not finished with you yet, Mulch Diggums, he whispered, logging out and clipping the cube onto Holly's belt. Juliet came through the door so fast her limbs were a blur. She had removed her helmet for better visibility, and the jade ring trailed behind her like a fishing lure on the end of a line. Butler would never take chances like this, she knew. He would have some perfectly practical, safe plan, which is why he had his blue diamond tattoo and she didn't. Well, maybe she didn't want a tattoo. Maybe she wanted a life of her own. She quickly assessed the situation. Holly's aim was true. The two gorillas were rubbing their scorched hands, and Spiro was stamping his feet like a spoiled child. Only Blunt was on the floor, going for his gun. Even though the bodyguard was on his hands and knees, he was still almost at her eye level. Aren't you going to give me a chance to get up? He asked. No, said Juliet, whipping the jade ring around like the stone that felled Goliath. It struck the bridge of Blunt's nose, cracking it and effectively blinding him for a couple of minutes. Plenty of time for the Chicago police to get down the shaft. Blunt was out of the game. Juliet had expected to feel some satisfaction, but all she felt was sadness. There was no joy in violence. Pex and Chips felt they should do something. Perhaps disabling the girl would earn them a bonus from Mr. Spiro. They circled Juliet, fists raised. Juliet wagged a finger at them. Sorry, boys, you have to go to sleep. The bodyguards ignored her, tightening the radius of their circle. I said, go to sleep. Still no response. You have to use the exact words that I mesmerized them to respond to, said Holly in her earpiece. Juliet sighed. If I must. Okay, gentlemen. Barney says go to sleep. Pex and Chips were snored before they hit the ground. That just left Spiro, and he was too busy gibbering to be any threat. He was still gibbering when the SWAT team put the cuffs on him. I'll talk to you back at base, said the captain sternly to Juliet. You're a danger to your comrades and yourself. Yes, sir, said Juliet contritely. I don't know what I came over me, sir. She glanced upward. A slight heat haze seemed to be drifting toward the elevator chute. The principal was safe. Holly holstered her weapon, buzzing up her shield. Time to go, she said, the volume on her PA turned to a minimum. Holly wrapped the camfoil tightly around Artemis, making certain no limbs were peeking out. It was imperative that they leave while the elevator was empty. Once forensics and the press got here, even a slight shimmer in the air might be caught on film. As they flew across the room, Spiro was being led from the lab. He had finally managed to calm down. This was a setup, he proclaimed in his best innocent voice. My lawyers are going to rip you guys apart. Artemis could not resist in speaking as they floated past his ear. Farewell, John, he whispered. Never mess with a boy genius. Spiro howled at the ceiling like a demented wolf. Mulch was waiting across the street from the Fontex lab revving the van like a Grand Prix driver. He sat behind the wheel on an orange crate, with a short plank taped to his foot. The other end of the plank was taped to the accelerator. Juliet studied the system nervously. Shouldn't you untie that foot, in case you need to use the brake? Brake? Mulch laughed. Why would I use the brake? I'm not doing my driving test here. In the back of the van, Artemis and Holly simultaneously reached for their seatbelts.